Hi, I'm here with Miranda Wang, the CEO and founder of Novo Loop, a pioneering climate tech startup that transforms difficult to recycle plastic waste into high value, sustainable chemical feedstocks. So you've been working on this problem for a very long time. Can you talk a little bit about how your thinking has evolved during this process of building the company? When I really started working on the plastic issue was actually even before Novaloop. My co-founder and I started working on recycling since we were in high school. And I think at the time, the thinking was just around how do we make all this waste go away? You know, can we engineer some bacteria, make this stuff break down faster? And then you realize just having all this plastic degrade and decompose into CO2, it doesn't solve any problem. Actually, that just creates a bunch of greenhouse gases. You have to actually make something out of these carbons, learning about not just how to build a cool science you know, process, but what does the world really need so that a solution can actually be something adopted by industry mm. and become part of industry. The circular economy is very limited today. It's very small because we don't have enough solutions. We are making huge amounts of plastics, over 300 million metric tons per year, and it's all coming from virgin fossil fuel resources. Only 9% of plastics today are actually getting recycled. 9% globally is absolutely shocking as a number. At the moment, we're doing that recycling mechanically, but your solution is to do it chemically. Can you talk a little bit about that? What's your innovation? Novaloop is a chemical innovation company focused on building a circular economy. And we've invented a new chemical process to convert some of the most ubiquitous plastics into high performance materials that can displace virgin fossil fuel uh, materials and chemicals. We focus on a type of plastic waste called polyethylene, which makes up about one third of all the plastics that we produce. It's in the triangle, you know, recycling logo is the number two and number four material. Very long chain of carbons with hydrogen sticking out of it. And we're breaking those carbon bonds and taking those you know, from very long carbon chain sizes down to very small building blocks of only four to nine carbons. This is something that would happen to polyethylene out in nature too, if you leave it under the sun, but over hundreds of years. So we've accelerated this process and we stop the reaction when the, the carbons are broken down just into small enough pieces where they're still useful, but before they become CO2. Without getting into too much technicality, essentially, you know, we're not taking the plastic and breaking it back down into oil and then taking it through the supply chain again. Instead, we're taking the polyethylene and breaking them down into chemical building blocks that are already leapfrogging five or six steps of the traditional fossil fuel value chain. What you're holding is shredded polyethylene. So this is post-consumer polyethylene. It's coming from all sorts of sources, little pieces of trash bags, agricultural plastics, packaging that's used in factories, um, all sorts of things that is made from polyethylene. And this is the feedstock? And this is the feedstock. Okay. So this is life-cycled polyol. These are the half-built-up polymers that are made from the carbons that were from that feedstock. And then finally, we have the finished material. This is the finished material. These are life-cycled thermoplastic polyurethane, or TPU. And this TPU can be used to be molded into shoe soles, into car seats, into all sorts of things. And so these are the world's only virgin quality polyurethane made with post-consumer carbon content. That's the quote right there. No, it's not really a recycled material, not in the traditional what means, because those materials have gone through what we call a heat cycle. You've already melted and, and remolded it multiple times, so it loses performance every time. This is chemically recycled, so it's never gone through a heating cycle before. It's just built up using the molecules that come from the waste. And you mentioned 300 million tons of virgin plastic per year is going into the waste systems. Clearly that's a challenge around scale, right? So I'd love to get you to talk a little bit about the technical scientific challenges you faced in making Nova Loop technology commercially viable. One of the main reasons that recycling is so difficult to achieve today is that it struggles economically. Recycled materials cost more than materials made from virgin fossil fuel resources while still performing in a worse way. In today's world, you know, the virgin plastics are so cheap to make. You're talking about materials generally that are priced at a dollar a kilogram. Um, and so to achieve that, you need factories of very, very large sizes. So when we are developing a new chemical innovation like this, we have to figure out how are we gonna compete economically with them 
given that our first factories are not going to be so big. This comes down to some of the clever designs I mentioned. So having a shorter process, so having fewer steps that you need to commit, you know, raw materials, utilities, and labor, you know, into. And the second thing is making higher value products. So not making products that are only dependent on, you know, commodity prices, but products that can command some specialty pricing. So you can actually get those, get this business off the ground at a relatively small scale uh, facility. And then we had to develop the products that can meet those needs in those kinds of markets. How do you feel that you're able to sort of get to that scale where you're going to have a meaningful impact on the global plastic waste problem? The first for us was making sure that we are targeting the right products. For us, we chose to go into polyurethane markets where the markets and the applications are very mature and the customers know exactly what specifications they want on these materials. Even though we're making them from kind of unconventional building blocks, by the time it's a plastic pellet and someone's molding it into a cell phone case or a shoe sole, they don't notice the difference. Then the second point is how do you build the supply chain so that you can have the scale that you need? So in a circular economy, supply chains are going to be more decentralized. You will have smaller plants than you have you know, fossil fuel refineries. In our case, we're looking to build facilities that, are, that, are, that have capacities between 10 to 20,000 tons per year. And that really matters because you want to be able to source consistent enough feedstocks that that facility can use the waste as a, as a reliable starting material. Um, and another thing I think that's very important is understanding what capacities are available out there and not trying to build everything. Who else can you work with and partner with and reduce the capital needs required to actually bring the process to, to large economies of scale? And ultimately, what do you think it's going to take to make plastics circular? And, and how do we accelerate that process? The plastics that we produce today in these large volumes, we're not doing it by accident. It's because they have amazing unit economics and performance properties, and they're so deeply embedded into how we make everything that our modern lives depend on. They're not going away. It took 10 years to develop this first process, and we are really, really close to being able to build our first facility and to take that into full scale. Beyond this, there's so many other ways that we can expand this innovation in terms of taking other kinds of waste feedstock, making more kinds of products so we can expand the market reach. Because the circular economy is not just about making plastic from plastic, it's also about making chemicals from plastics. It's also about making lots of other things that right now are dependent on fossil fuels from the carbons in plastic. So it's really the future of the new chemical industry. And I find that extremely exciting. And tell us how the Rolex Awards has, has helped you in your mission. The, the Rolex Awards have really come in at the, the most pivotal moments in our journey. So in 2019, when I was selected to be a Rolex laureate, we were still in the laboratory developing this technology. And Rolex came and their philanthropic funding really supported and helped us through that period. And last year, when we brought online our demonstration plant, which is a very major technical milestone in that we were able to integrate all of these process steps and run this facility in a 24-7 continuous way. Uh, Rolex was a great sponsor in that project itself. With that technology demonstration, we've been able to secure a lot more funding and resources so that now we are actually designing our first commercial production facility. Miranda, you're tackling one of the great challenges of our time, a, a real challenge that has such scale. Um, we really do look forward to following your progress in the coming years. Thank you so much for being with us. Thanks, Greg.